with the launch of Fire Emblem Three Hopes, now felt like a good time to follow up a video I am very proud of, my full Fire Emblem timeline. In that video, I covered every single game in the Fire Emblem timeline, in what I feel is the canonical story order, and at the end of that video I promised to do a follow up with Three Houses, a game that only came out during that video's production. But I wanted to wait for all the DLC to launch first, who knew what secrets may be lying in the Cindered Ashes after all? Perhaps some definitive proof of this title's connections to the previous ones would be revealed? Unfortunately not, but I am glad I waited because shortly after the DLC's release, Nintendo Dream published the, to date, only interview with the Fire Emblem Three Houses development team, and in that interview, Toshiyuki Kusakihara, the director of the game, was asked if Three Houses' world was connected to any prior Fire Emblem title, and he said, I don't think so, at least not as far as I can tell. I mean, there could still be some mysteries in the land of Arcania that we don't know about yet. There are some items in the exploration quest that are evocative of past titles, and that was all thanks to the developers at Koei Tecmo. I think it was all really clever. There's a location by the name of Ogma Mountains that comes up, but this is due to us having Celtic mythology as an underlying central theme, rather than it being related to past Fire Emblem games. In Three Houses, we use names from mythological themes as locations and towns instead of character names. This was a result of us imagining a sense of realism for the world. So that was a bit of a demotivator. The devs seemingly didn't plan on making this game part of the expanding Fire Emblem timeline, and this knowledge kind of put me off focusing on this video. That was until I realised something. Who cares? Many of the prior games weren't officially shown to be connected, but part of the fun I had making that video was finding those connections and piecing together a timeline, and there really isn't anything stopping me from doing that again. Heck, Kusa Hakihara even said they're not connected as far as I can tell, which to me means that if I can find a connection between the two, a place in the timeline that it logically fits with some evidence to back it up, then maybe we can have the world of Fodlan and the story of Garak Mak Monastery's School of Heroes be a part of the grander Fire Emblem world. So sit back, get comfy, and let me reveal to you where Fire Emblem Three Houses and Fire Emblem Three Hopes fits in the Fire Emblem timeline. In Kahusa Hakihara's answer, he brings up two points of connection between Three Houses and the prior games, items and places. And throughout all of my research into this game, looking at the world building, characters, item lists and place names, those two factors are really it. Evidence is very minimal, but working with what we have might just be enough to pin down an exact spot in the timeline. The easiest of the evidence to work with are the items, specifically the three regalia of King Adra of the Arcanian series of games. These three weapons, the Lance of Gradivus, the Sword Mercurius, and the Bow Parthia, are legendary weapons first introduced in Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, and passed down through many of that world's heroes. There's also the Axe Hortclear, a weapon said to be on the same level of the regalia, wielded by the Wyvern Princess Minerva, that was just never owned by Adra. Marth's duo of games are the only ones where these four play any significant role, but it doesn't mean it's the only game they are included in. And I don't mean the fake regalia that you can craft in Fire Emblem Echoes. These regalia first reappeared in Fire Emblem Awakening, and then again in Fire Emblem Three Houses, in a state that is significantly worse for wear. The regalia in Three Houses are rusted over, unrecognisable until a blacksmith has the skills, and you have the cash, to revitalise them. This state of being would imply that they have gone unused for a long time, meaning that Three Houses is, at least, set after the events of the hero King Marth. But we can take this one step further thanks to the events of Fire Emblem Awakening. The regalia in Three Houses are in the base game and so are indisputably canon, but in the Fire Emblem community, I have seen many argue that the regalia's presence in Awakening are not, because they appear in the DLC Xenologue, Infinite Regalia, where the player has a random chance of finding one in a chest as they fight through Dead Lords. This takes place in the Out Realms, where Chrom and Co experience many events outside of the game's narrative, and many that some would argue are non-canon. Chrom and his army never canonically receive the Regalia, and so they don't exist in Elise. But I do not agree with this. The Out Realms canonicity is debated, but two things in it are 100% canon. The existence of the Out Realms themselves, and it is through these gates that Lucina and Future Grima return to the past, and the Future Past DLC. 
As mentioned in the last video, Fire Emblem Awakening splits off into three timelines. The main story, the world left behind by Lucina et al, and the future past, a scenario where our heroes go to the future and defeat Grima there, creating a timeline where the world is saved and Lucina becomes the next exalt. This happy ending timeline might not seem canon, but it is thanks to the existence of Morgan, Robin's child. Morgan is consistently portrayed as coming from another timeline to the other children, and in a special conversation with either Cynthia or Inigo, Morgan will talk about having two identical copies of the same tactics book that belong to Robin. And in Futures Past, we see how this is possible. Morgan has the book given to them by the Grima of that timeline, and one from the player's Robin who came to the future in that DLC. So this ties the DLC with the story narratively and ensures its canonicity. This alone should be evidence that the events of the Outrealms can be canon and thus so can the Infinite Regalia mission, but I can take it one step further and show that the area that the Infinite Regalia takes place in isn't just some random location in some random Outrealm space. The mission takes place in one of the timelines specifically and that is the Fallen timeline where Grima wins. The mission Infinite Regalia has the player battle 36 dead lords on their way to claiming their prize, and like in most DLC missions there is a unique piece of battle dialogue for each of the characters. The most interesting dialogue comes from the second generation characters though, as each one shares a sense of familiarity with the dead lords, with Lauren outright stating that he believes his mother Muriel is amongst them. He hopes this isn't the case, but these dialogue options along with the fact that there are exactly the same amount of dead lords as there are first generation characters heavily implies that they are one and the same, that these guardians of the infinite regalia are our fallen heroes, killed and resurrected by Grima, made to stand guard over these sacred treasures. This is further backed up by Brady's comments on the state of the area, a mess with no people around, a state similar to the world that he and his friends left behind. From this we can conclude that the infinite regalia doesn't take place in some fantasy world, it takes place in the fallen timeline and so by proxy the regalia exist in this timeline in perfect condition. So even if Krom and his friends never receive them canonically, this is proof that they still exist in this world and have yet to be destroyed. This also means we can put Three Houses after Awakening as well, which puts it pretty close to the end of the timeline, only having to now contend its location with Alib and the Binding Blade, the last game in the series according to my original timeline. But let's take a quick aside to change that. As pointed out by the comments in the last video, Krom has lines in Awakening that show he is aware of the legends of Alib in a similar manner that showed us he was aware of the Tellius error. So because of that, the events of the Binding Blade and Blazing Sword need to happen before Awakening instead. So I've rejigged the timeline slightly and placed Awakening at the end. I also added in the updates in Fire Emblem Heroes, which is now up to book 6. Anyway, back to the location of Fodlan, and no, Fodlan isn't a place we've seen before. I almost thought it could be Jugdraw, and considering how much of an influence genealogy had on Three Houses, I wouldn't be surprised if it was intended, but it doesn't match up enough for me to be able to say the two are one and the same. Fodland is definitely a new location. Now, as pointed out by Kusakihara, many places in Three Houses are named after previous Fire Emblem characters, but that doesn't mean anything at this point. We know Three Houses at the end of the timeline after all these heroes have gone down in Legend. But there is one place that I think should be mentioned. Nabata. In Alib there is the Nabata Desert, and in Three Houses you have the Nabataeans, the name given to this game's dragon tribe. And this connection becomes stronger when you remember that Nabata was home of the remaining dragons in the Fire Emblem timeline. In Awakening, there were only four dragons to appear. Grima the Fell Dragon, Tiki the Divine Dragon, Naui the Manakit, and her daughter the Half Dragon Na. This provided strong evidence that the scouring of Alib had already taken place before Awakening happened, and Naui's backstory about how she was taken from her parents, rescued by Bantu and taken to Elise, supports the idea that the Nabata Desert may be the last place that dragons exist in the world, and so may also be the ancestral home of the dragons in Fodlan, named the Nabataeans after their home. Of course, all the Nabataeans we know were born in Fodlan, so none of them could have come from Alib. But there is someone who could have, the one who is mother to all of the Nabataeans, the creator Sothis. 
Sothis is obviously a dragon, having all the telltale signs of a dragon, and not to mention all of her children are dragons. While detractors may argue that we never see her transform into one, and games like Heroes don't have her affected by dragon killing weapons like the Falcon, that's because the small version of Sothis we see isn't her complete form. In the same Nintendo Dream interview, Kusakihara said, It's because Sothis was in an incomplete state while she was inside Byleth. Sothis didn't remember what she really looked like, nor had she been fully restored, so she looks like a little girl to represent that she's not fully there yet. This could mean that her dragon side is part of what's missing. She doesn't remember she is a dragon, therefore her spirit form doesn't have the characteristics of a dragon. But given her pointy ears, her hair colour, and the fact that everyone else in her bloodline are dragons, it seems safe to say that she is as well. There is also the way dragon blood works in three houses. Crests are formed when a human received the blood of a dragon, as the ten elites all received their original crests from drinking the blood of the Nabataeans. This is almost identical to how the Twelve Crusaders in genealogy got their divine bloodlines, by being gifted the blood of the divine dragons. The same thing is happening here, and while genealogy never describes the characters as having crests, dragon blood mixing with human blood has been known to create markings in other Fire Emblem games. You have the Branded in the Tellius series, which is not just from dragons but all Lagus, and you have the Mark of the Exalt in Awakening, which is held by those who have Naga's blood. The fact that this brand in particular is passed through the bloodline and sometimes doesn't surface on Descendants is very similar to the way crests work. So Sothis is from the Nabata Desert. The question now is why did she come to Fodland, and why do the people of Fodland believe she created the world? This is simple enough to explain. Seros herself made up the history of the world of Fodland, as stated in the game itself, and so the world has been around much longer than that. This is further backed up by a book in the Abyss, which talks about how the calendar used throughout the game is not the original calendar, and speculates it was made by the church as a way of essentially restarting history. It's also important that Sothis brought with her magic and advancements that they share with the improvised human race at the time, effectively creating a new world for them. But why was the world in this state you might ask? It's not like Alib lacked magic or was uncivilized. How could one dragon, potentially a divine dragon as we know they were still around thanks to Fae, do so much? And so, I guess now it's time for the big reveal. With all this evidence in place, where does the world of Fodlan fit in the Fire Emblem timeline? Well, at the end of course. At the end of the Fallen timeline, that is. The people of Plegia, the cult of Grima, uses the avatar Robin to successfully revive their fallen god, the fell dragon Grima, by successfully killing the exalt of Elise and leader of their opposing forces, Krom. Despite Krom's death and Grima's resurrection into the world, the shepherds and allies live on and continue a long battle with Grima and the Grimliel for around 20 years. Grima's path of destruction encompasses the whole world and soon it is all laid to ruin. But humanity is not yet wiped out. Pockets of civilization survive through stealing and hiding underground. Only a small task force, the New Shepherds led by the daughter of Krom Lucina, fight against Grima's mighty influence. But even for them, it is a losing battle. With all hope lost, the New Shepherds conduct a plan. If they can't save their world, they can at least prevent any other timelines like this existing. And so Lucina travels back in time through the Outrealm Gates, soon to be followed by her friends. However, Grima the Fell Dragon catches wind of their plan. He failed to prevent Lucina from travelling to the past, and so decides to go back in time himself to ensure the same future. But he never returns. Grima is killed in the past, thus ending his reign of terror in the present. In addition, the blood of the Hero King and the legendary Blade of the Falcon have also been removed from this timeline. It is a world without heroes or monsters. Where the biggest threat are the lonely Dread Knights, guarding lost treasures with no master to relieve them of their duty, eventually fading away and leaving their treasure to be stolen or forgotten, rusting away in the ground somewhere. But the world is not empty, there are survivors, and one of these is the divine dragon Sothis. 
a resident of the city of Arcadia in the Nabata Desert, and potentially the only survivor of Grima's Wrath. Sophthis wandered across the world looking for company, and eventually found herself in the land soon to be known as Fodlan. Choosing to blend in among the humans who hid in this land and show them that she was on their side, she chose to take a human form. Using her millennia of experience and knowledge, she shared her powers with humanity. She also had a number of children who grew up to possess the same powers she did. But eventually, conflict arose, either out of fear of what Sothis and her family could do, or out of a desire for more strength. The Agathan people clashed with Sothis and her children, but were almost entirely wiped out and forced underground to Shambhala, eventually becoming known as those who slither in the dark. This left Fodlan mostly vacant, but some of humanity had sided with Sothis while others had remained neutral in the conflict. Following this war, Sothis made it her goal to repopulate the land of Fodlan, and after many, many years and children later, she decided to rest and recover in a holy tomb in the land of Zanardo. But the Agathans wanted revenge, and convinced the power-hungry warrior Nemesis to attack and kill Sothis in her sleep, which they do. From Sothis's bones, the sword of the creator is forged, and her heart becomes its crest stone. Her blood is drunk by Nemesis and gifts him the crest of flames, and both incredible power and long-lasting life. Pushed on to become even stronger, Nemesis attacks the land of Zanardo and kills almost all of the Nabataeans, using their remains to forge more weapons which he gifts to his allies, the Ten Elites, who drink the blood of Sothis' children to gain crests and powers of their own. With the backing of the Ten Elites, Nemesis then takes Fodlan under his rule and creates a nation constantly fighting for power. However, not all of the Nabataeans have died. While some, like Saint Sikol and his daughter Sethlene, had previously left and were now in hiding, Seros chose to instead make herself known and help those suffering under the madness created by Nemesis. She does this for 41 years in the land of Enbar, and establishes the Church of Seros, a group dedicated to Sothis. On the 41st year, an oracle from the Church of Seros speaks to a man named Wilhelm Paul Hersfeld a nobleman and convinces him to form the Adrestian Empire, which he does in alliance with the church. Wilhelm is a man with much unified power, which he uses over 32 years to convince the Ten Elites to join his side, and together they wage the war of heroes against Nemesis, eventually resulting in his death at the hands of Seros. After the war, Wilhelm I is succeeded by his son, Lycheon I, and the Empire takes control of all of Fodland giving the country a lot of power. Seros uses this power to have the Ten Elite killed for what they did to her family over 100 years ago, and rewrites history to make her mother Sothis a goddess, the creator of all life, hiding the truth about Nemesis and subsequently hiding the truth about the world before Sothis. For the rest of the story of Three Houses, you're just going to have to play the game yourself and experience the events of Byleth and the students of Garrick Mock Monastery or shares in their tale of revenge against Byleth. Three Hopes and Three Houses share the same lore and are alternative timelines to one another, splitting off in the fall of the year 1179 of the Fodling calendar. Byleth and Shares fight, and if the latter dies here, the events of Three Houses takes place, with its own timeline split based around which house Byleth chooses to teach. If Shares lives, however, then they're around to help the house leaders rout the bandit Costas before they make it to Ramaya village. This means they never meet Byleth, and Shares manages to kill Costas in the first encounter, something Byleth never did. These two factors drastically change the course of Fodlan's future, and creates three more timelines based entirely around which house Shares chooses to associate with. So much power in the hands of these two individuals. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. It became surprisingly hefty, but I'd seen so much debate about whether this game should be considered part of the timeline or just its own thing, like with the first Warriors games, that I really just wanted to go into the nitty gritty of the evidence. And I hope it convinced you. If you enjoyed this video, I would love it if you left a like and shared it with your friends, whether they be fellow Fire Emblem fans or just lovers of deep and complicated video game timelines. Comment below if you agree with my conclusions or if I missed anything you think is vital evidence. Or maybe I made a mistake somewhere, but Sothis hope I didn't. On screen right now are all of our $5 patrons and above. If you want to know how to become one of the lovely elite, then click the icons on screen or check in the description below. 
My name is Nantendrix, and I hope you hit subscribe so that you can always remember to return to the source.